Welcome. I want to talk with you now about relevancy and character evidence, and we're going to look at them from the standpoint of both the Federal Rules of Evidence and the Florida Evidence Evidentiary Code. Now, this first slide that I've got up here right now uh, outlines the elements of relevancy uh, in a Florida court, and you'll notice that there's only one of them that is different when it comes to the Federal Rules, and that's the last one down here at the bottom. Uh, the undue delay and waste of time. Otherwise, I'm always doing the balancing test between the probative value and the substantial danger of unfair prejudice, confusion of the issues, misleading of the jury, or needless presentation of cumulative evidence. Uh, this is the classic 403 balancing test. It's the last refuge of scoundrels when they're objecting in court. Uh, and it's something that uh, you need to understand because it's sort of the, the bulk work, the core of what it means to determine the admissibility of evidence at trial. And so it's worth going back over and talking about for a moment. Um, if its probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of, not the actuality of, but the danger of, this means that as the court, uh, as the trial judge, I've got to look at the evidence uh, that they want to admit. And I have to say, okay, what does this go to prove in the case? And then I have to weigh it against the possibility that it'll be unfairly prejudicial, uh, that it will confuse things, that it's going to mislead the jury, or just be cumulative. And I weigh these two, and the probative value has got to be substantially outweighed by which means that on the scale, the probative value is relatively slight and the danger is relatively high. It's a standard that cuts in favor of admissibility, all other things being equal. So that sort of gets relevancy uh, cemented into our heads so that, that we understand it properly going forward. Let's now talk about character evidence. And, and I'm going to start, uh, because character evidence is a subject that is often difficult uh, to, for understanding on the part of, um, of lawyers who don't try cases dealing with it. I'm going to begin by walking you through the federal rules of evidence as they relate to character. And then we'll segue into a discussion of the Florida rules of character and how they're different. Now this flow chart that I've got over here is going to be a series of slides. And each slide is going to have a box that will pop up. And you'll see the first one right now uh, is that 404 deals with evidence relating to character, other crimes, wrongs, or habits. That's the purpose of the rule. Character means character trait. Other crimes, wrongs, or habits mean um, circumstantial evidence of character that's being used for a non-character purpose. So the first question that I ask myself is am I trying to admit evidence of this type at trial? And if the answer is yes, I need to know if character is it specifically at issue in the case. Now in a civil case, it's relatively easy to determine if character is specifically at issue. I look at the cause of action. And if the cause of action has within it an element that reflects on the character of the people who are involved. Classic examples uh, being child custody cases, negligent hiring cases. Um, in those instances, character is relevant. I'm going to admit it. I'm going to allow it to be admitted any way that I need it to be admitted. And that's our third box right here. Admissible, and I can show it through specific acts. Now you'll notice that it flows from the top to the bottom in our flow chart as we're dealing with character evidence. And that's the way character evidence works in a civil trial where character is at issue or in a criminal trial where character is at issue in the case, although character is rarely specifically at issue in a criminal trial. Most of the time, instead of the answer being yes, the answer is no. Character is not specifically at issue in the case. And what the federal rules of evidence do is they say, well, if that's the the set of circumstances. If character is not necessary, if the government does not have the burden of proving an element 
of the offense based upon the character of the accused, then we are not going to let character into the case unless the accused chooses to make it relevant. And the reason for that is because the character of the accused can have, has a, has a very great danger of being unfairly prejudicial. And in and of itself uh, is relatively slight from a probative value perspective. And so we don't want to open that door to character unless the accused fully and knowingly decides to do so. And that's a decision that the accused makes with the advice of counsel. If they do, there are two ways that the accused can open the door, and then there's one way that the state can open the door based upon a non-character theory of relevancy. And you'll see those outlined over here in this box. It's 404A1, the pertinent character trait of the accused, 404A2, the pertinent character trait of the victim offered by the accused, and then 404B, other crimes, wrongs, or acts, often referred to as the non-character theory um, of relevancy, 404B evidence, if you will. So let's look at each of these in turn. We'll start with 404A1, character of the accused. The first step that I ask myself is, is this a pertinent character trait of the accused? And is it being offered by the accused first or by the prosecution after the accused has put on evidence to rebut what the accused has said? If it is first offered by the accused, then I am allowed to admit it. But it can only come in under the restrictions of Federal Rule of Evidence 405. And in the Federal Rules of Evidence, Character evidence is admissible on direct examination by opinion testimony or reputation testimony as to that pertinent character trait. Specific instances of conduct are not admissible on direct examination, uh, are potentially admissible on cross-examination. And that's the way it works. It's a very limited focus. And in the Florida system, it's even more limited because in Florida, we don't let in opinion testimony we only let in reputation testimony. So that's the first step I ask myself if it's a pertinent character trait and did the accused offer it. Most of the time, though, that's not the case. And when that's not the case, then the character trait is not admissible. Um, if I'm the state, I've got to consider trying to get it in through a 404B door. Other crimes, wrongs, or act offered for a non-character theory of relevancy. But I can't offer it to say that because the accused was a bad person in the past, it's more likely that he did it this time. Um, if I'm going to offer it under 404B, I've then got to go to my next box. I've got to show that I'm offering this character trait not for the purposes of propensity to say that the accused acted in accordance with the trait, but instead to show that the accused um, had a particular motive to commit the crime that there was opportunity or intent on the part of the accused, that they prepared, that they planned, that they had knowledge of what it was that they were doing, and that there was identity or an absence of mistake. And those are all classic 404B uh, theories of admissibility, non-character theories of relevancy, by the way. So that takes care of 404A1, and that's the way it must logically flow. Well, what about 404A2? when I'm dealing with the character of the victim. Now, 404A2, character of the victim, is different in the federal system as opposed to the Florida system. Well, first of all, I ask myself again, is it a pertinent character trait? And by pertinent, I mean, does it have relevancy to the crime charge or the defense that was raised? And then I ask myself, did the accused raise the issue first, or is the prosecution offering it to rebut something that the accused has already raised? And if that's the case, it's admissible. But again, it's through reputation and opinion testimony on direct or specific instances on cross-examination, controlled by Federal Rule of Evidence 405. And if it's the Florida Evidentiary Code, again, it's only reputation testimony. I cannot admit opinion testimony in a Florida court on a character trait. Now, if that's not the case, it's not going to be admissible under 404. A. And because it's the victim and not the accused, I can't use 404B to admit testimony of uh, a character trait about the
the victim. But what can I do? I can go and look at the other theories of impeachment that are available to me for any witness, and I can try to get that character testimony shoehorned into an appropriate level. And examples include character for truthfulness under 608, prior convictions under 609, prior inconsistent statements under 613, uh, common law bias motive uh, to lie, and then, of course, impeachment on a non-collateral matter. It's important that you understand that in the federal system, when I opened the door as the defense attorney to the character of the victim, I've opened the door for the prosecution to offer rebuttal evidence about the victim's character, but I've also opened the door to the character of the accused, the same character trait. That door swings both ways in the federal system uh, after a modification to the federal rules of evidence in the early 2000s. It does not swing both ways in the Florida court. I can open the door to the character of the victim and not make the character of the accused relevant at trial in a Florida court. And that's a specific difference between the two systems. Let's look at methods of proving character in the federal system. I can do it with reputation or opinion testimony, on cross-examination by asking about specific instances of conduct, and if I've raised the entrapment defense with specific instances to rebut the entrapment defense. So what is reputation testimony? Let's go through reputation testimony now because the foundational elements for it are specific uh, in nature and you need to know them so that you can recognize them. The first thing that you've got to be able to show is that the witness who's going to testify about the reputation is a member of the same community that the accused is part of. Then you've got to show that that witness has been a member of that community for a substantial period of time, that the accused or the victim has a reputation for that particular character trait within that community, that the witness knows of the reputation, and then you have the witness state that reputation. Now, what's interesting here is, is you don't see anywhere on this slide a requirement of personal knowledge concerning the character trait in question. So in other words, the witness's reputation testimony can be based upon inadmissible hearsay, third-party information, rumor, whatever it happens to be, as long as you can foundationally show that the witness is part of the community where that reputation uh, exists. Reputation testimony as to a pertinent character trait is admissible in both the Florida court and the federal court. Now, opinion testimony, on the other hand, is different. When I'm dealing with opinion testimony, I first have to show personal knowledge. I have to establish that the witness knows either the victim or the accused, whichever one I'm trying to offer the character trait about. I have to show that they've had sufficient contact to form an opinion as to that relevant character trait. So I've got a much more uh, up close and personal foundational requirement with uh, opinion testimony as opposed to reputation testimony. I have to then establish that there is in fact an opinion that the witness has about that character trait and then I have them state that opinion. The primary difference between opinion and reputation is that opinion testimony is derived from personal knowledge. Florida does not allow opinion testimony as to a pertinent character trait in a state court. The federal courts do. And that's a specific difference in the application of the evidentiary code uh, within those two jurisdictions. Now, I mentioned earlier that you can prove um, specific instances of conduct. You can ask questions on cross-examination of specific instances of conduct to attack the validity of the reputation or opinion testimony. When I ask these questions, um, they're designed to test the validity of the earlier testimony. Uh, I've got to have a good faith basis to ask the question. I can't make stuff up. I've got to have some reason to think that that fact actually exists, and I am bound by the answer that the witness gives. I can focus on the conduct, and I can't ask a guilt-assuming question. 
The idea is to test the validity of the reputation or opinion testimony. You know, if you've given this uh, opinion testimony, did you know this, 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 and this? Oh, you didn't. Would knowing this change your mind? Uh, it's to place in context how much weight the jury should give to that particular testimony on the part of the witness. Now let's segue from 404A, where we're dealing with a character theory of relevancy, to the non-character theory of relevancy, 404B. Um, I've got another flow chart for you. We start out with the idea of step number one. Was the evidence offered to show that the accused uh, was acting in conformity therewith? In other words, am I going to argue that because the accused did this in the past, it's more likely that they did it this time? It's a propensity argument. If I wish to make a propensity argument, I cannot offer it under a 404A theory. It's not going to be admissible. Um, in the federal court, if you're dealing with a crime of, sexual, of a sexual nature, either rape or molestation of a child or sexual assault, you do need to go look at 413, 414, 415, and 412 because there are some specific guidelines dealing with character uh, for those rules that are different from the 404B rule. But right now, we're just talking about your garden variety type felonies. If evidence is not being offered for propensity, then what I'm really doing is saying that it's a 404B theory of relevancy, just like it shows on the chart here. And in that instance, I have to show how the prior conduct proves motive, intent, absence of mistake, preparation, plan, scheme, knowledge, one of the non-exhaustive factors in 404B. The thing that I want you to remember is whenever 404B is used as a means of admitting character evidence for a non-character theory of relevancy, 403 is automatically implicated. You must do a probative value versus substantial danger of unfair prejudice analysis prior to admitting evidence under a 404B standard. So what's the burden of proof for 404B? You'll notice here I've got a four-prong test. These are the four questions that must be asked and answered uh, to the court's satisfaction before admitting 404B evidence. It's got to be for a proper purpose. can't be for propensity. It's got to be for one of the non-exhaustive factors. I have to apply the relevancy protections from Federal Rule of Evidence 104. Uh, I have to do the balancing test for 403. And then the last piece is that when I give this evidence to the jury, I should provide a limiting instruction as to the proper purpose for the use of this evidence in accordance with Federal Rule of Evidence 105. It's important that all four of these steps are properly followed in order to ensure that this evidence, when admitted, will not create an issue of potential error at the appellate level. Let's talk about um, the accused and victim's character trait under 404A to recap. It has to be a character trait of the accused or the victim or character trait for truthfulness. Those are the three types of character that I can potentially be admitting. Uh, the accused holds the key to the door of character at trial. And the accused can open that door by presenting witnesses, by having the accused testifying themselves, or by cross-examining another witness about the character of the accused or victim. And that power always resides with the accused in a criminal case. It has to be a pertinent character trait. And pertinent means relevant to the issue and controversy at trial. Same thing with the character of the victim. Um, there is a slight difference, though. If you look at the slide here, you'll see that um, when we're dealing with the victim's character in a homicide case, because the victim's gone, the state should be allowed to offer evidence of the victim's character for peacefulness, uh, particularly when they need to rebut an allegation that the victim was the aggressor. And so that door is available to you in a homicide case. And then you'll notice that 404A2 uh, is tied to 404A1, and that's that door opening. Uh, character of the victim opens the door to the character of the accused. That is only relevant to the federal system and not the Florida system. Remember, when dealing with character for truthfulness, 
Every witness who takes the stand and testifies uh, has placed their character for truthfulness at issue. Character for truthfulness can come up through a 404A theory of relevancy or a 608 theory of relevancy. In either case, when uh, I attack the character for truthfulness, I'm still subject to a 403 analysis as to whether or not it should come in. And what I cannot do is offer evidence that a person is truthful prior to their character for truthfulness being attacked. All witnesses are presumed to tell the truth until such time as we know that they're lying. At that point is when we can get into uh, the character for truthfulness uh, analysis. Otherwise, we, we're not really concerned with it. So now we've looked at the federal rules of evidence. In this slide, we've gone back to our blue color because we're dealing with the Florida Evidentiary Code again. Um, this is from 90.4041. And 90.4041 is just the Florida version of the federal rule of evidence 404A. And it basically states the non-propensity use of character evidence. You cannot offer character evidence to prove that someone acted in conformity therewith. You have to have another reason. It's got to be pertinent. And again, in the state of Florida, the accused holds the key to the door, not the state in a criminal proceeding. Uh, and here's an example. If I've got a prosecution of a defendant for murder and the defendant presents two witnesses who testify that he has a reputation for being peaceful and nonviolent, the prosecution could then present witnesses who will testify that the defendant's reputation is that he is an aggressive, violent person. Door's been opened. The other side can now walk through. Works the same way with the character of the victim, um, with the caveat that if I'm in a homicide case, um, once evidence has been put on that the victim was the aggressor, I can offer evidence of character to rebut that the victim was the aggressor. Why? Because the victim is not there to provide character evidence. And then we've got an example of it right here on the slide. I'll let you take a look at it. Basically, I've got a defendant claiming self-defense in the killing of the victim. Well, when a defendant claims self-defense, that's a tripwire to tell us uh, that they must be saying that the victim is the aggressor. And that means that character evidence of the victim for peacefulness is now admissible to rebut uh, that position. I want you to remember that Federal Rule of Evidence 404 is broader than the Florida Evidentiary Code 90.4041, uh, specifically in the way in which it treats the character of the victim and its connection to the character of the accused from a rebuttal perspective. We've talked about that previously. Now, this is the list from 90.4042, uh, the equivalent of the Federal Rule of Evidence 404B. And you'll notice that um, it's non-exhaustive, and it relatively mi mimics uh, the same approach from the federal system. It restates that I cannot admit evidence simply for the purposes of arguing propensity, that there has to be similarity between the charge defense and the collateral offense, and by collateral offense, they mean the underlying conduct upon which the other acts are based. And when I'm offering it to show identity, Florida even tells us that there have to be identifiable points of similarity between the charged offense and the collateral offenses. And there has to be some sort of special character that makes them sufficiently unusual to point to the defendant. If you think about it for a moment, that makes sense. What they're really saying is, is it can't be a generic same type of crime. It's got to be a type of crime done in a particular fashion. Maybe they leave a particular calling card. They do something every time they burgle a house that is unique. Uh, you might think of uh, Home Alone and the Wet Bandits, how they always filled the house with water after they were done. Something like that would give a sufficient notice of similarity to be admissible under a 404B theory in the federal rules or a 4042 theory um, in the Florida rules. Now, when relevancy is shown, for the absence of mistake or accident, the collateral offense must be strikingly similar. And this is language uh, from cases in the state of Florida. And there has to be some unique characteristic or combination of characteristics. The teaching point, the take home point, is that in Florida, when we're dealing with non-character theories of relevancy for character evidence, 
We want them to be sufficiently similar that we're comfortable with the jury knowing about it. Why? Because it has phenomenal prejudicial effect, and we want that prejudicial effect to be appropriate and not unfair. As I mentioned earlier, Florida only allows proof of character traits by reputation and not through opinion. Um, that takes care of uh, Federal Rule of Evidence 403, Florida Rule of Evidence, uh, uh, Florida Evidence Code 403, 404A, 404B, and 4041 and 4042. When I come back with you next time, we'll talk about the rest of the 400 series in the Florida and the Federal Code and how they compare and contrast with one another.